just as a way of introduction for the people who are will be watching this in uh, on the web we are making the comparison between the traditions of the of Roman Catholicism compared to what the Bible says in such a way that anyone who hears this and sees these videos will be able to uh, analyze by themselves or by yourself uh, these, uh, these doctrines and compare to the Holy Bible and make a decision as to who do we follow, doctrines of men or the uh, Word of God. And uh, we retain the fact, that this, the, the scream of the Reformation, that the Bible is the supreme authority. It is not the only authority but the supreme authority. By that I am saying, and we are saying, that the church, the magisterium of the church, or the church itself, has authority, the tradition has authority, only if those authorities submit to the authority of the Bible. So we stand with the reformation of sola scriptura, where uh, the claim is that the scriptures alone are the supreme, is the supreme authority because they are infallible, inerrant, uh, absolute truth, and uh, unchangeable. That, like the traditions that change with the times and the cultures, the Bible does not submit to any, to any culture or to any tradition and it stands uh, as supreme authority. Um, so, with that, we will continue. We, the last time that we were here, we talked about transubstantiation, uh, which was instituted by Pope Innocent III in the year 1200. 15. You're welcome. Uh, that's number 27 in the, the list of traditions that we are following. Uh, and we uh, got into a discussion and analysis of the difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation and uh, the, the differences between some of the reform doctrines uh, who are the Reformed Baptists and the Presbyterians who sometimes take a different uh, view of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the supper. In any event, the differences, the difference between Roman Catholicism and any other tradition and any other um, biblical position is that uh, the Roman, Roman Catholicism believes in transubstantiation which is the uh, transition of the natural elements bread and wine into the real flesh and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that it appears like the wine and the bread, but is really the blood of the Lord Jesus, while um, the biblical tradition is what Jesus says, what I'm telling you in John 6.63, what I told you is spirit, the flesh prophets you nothing, and whoever worships uh, God worships him in the spirit and in truth. Uh, then uh, uh, 28, we come to the confession of sins to a priest uh, instituted by Pope Innocent III in the Lateran Council in 1215. 1, the Lateran 
councils, you probably uh, uh, know that the Lateran uh, palace was where the Pope lived for a while before uh, the Vatican which was given to them when we arrived to that by Mussolini. Mussolini was the one who actually established the Vatican as an independent uh, uh, state. I believe that that's the case. But we will get there when we study the history. Uh, the confession is, uh, is a biblical doctrine. Because the, the, it says, you shall confess your sins to one another. And that is clear because uh, you need the support of someone, a brother who will help you to stay in, 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 in course with uh, the responsibility to, to, come, to demonstrate to your own heart uh, that you are a Christian. Uh, but, and also we confess our sins when we offend somebody, we'll say, I'm sorry, I did do this. If you just don't say, I'm sorry, but for no reason, you, you say why. And you do uh, restitution and things like that, uh, but not absolutely necessary unto salvation. But this, the confession of sin in the in Roman Catholicism is to a priest and the priest says this thing in Latin ego te absolvo which means I absolve you okay of course he's doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus and like that I absolve you now the problem with this is number one is that if we confess to a priest, then the priest will have to confess to you at the end of your confession. Because it says, confess your sins to one another. Okay? But on the other hand, the problem with confession is that confession is the ticket unto restoring your salvation. You lose your salvation in Roman Catholicism when you sin. In the biblical, in, in, in the Bible, you don't lose your salvation because it's given to you by God. But in Roman Catholicism, any time you sin, you lose your salvation. And you restore your salvation by going to the priest. In the moment the priest says, Ego, te absolvo, you are safe again until when? until you sin again. When you sin again, you lose your salvation, and then compassion has that ability. That is what is wrong. That is also what is wrong is this, that you have to do works of, uh, of uh, penance. When you receive your confession, uh, you are forgiven, but you are given some um, um, obligations to do either a trip to one of the places where uh, one of the saints or or or, 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 or Satan appear in the form of a woman that they call Mary. The Mary of the apparitions is not the same Mary that we honor. We respect and love Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus. But the Mary that is pro pro claim uh, in apparitions is not Mary the mother of our Lord Jesus it's Satan himself that appears as an angel of light uh, when uh, 2 Corinthians 11 it says and it is no wonder that, that Satan appears him, himself as an angel of light I think it's 2 Corinthians 11 14 I'm not quite sure the verse uh, but also in First Galatians, in Gal uh, Galatians, uh, First Galatians, Galatians chapter one, uh, verse one is big to up to six, and says, "Foolish Galatians, who had brought you to another gospel? If I of an angel 
from heaven will teach you another gospel. Let it be what? Anathema. So how do we know that is not the mother of my Lord, Jesus? Because she proclaims in these apparitions that person that appears proclaims another gospel. He says, if you have an scapular, if you do this and you do that, you will be safe. But the Bible says, if you trust and believe in Jesus Christ alone, you are safe. So if that well was a gospel, real gospel, that person will say, trust in the Lord Jesus and you shall be safe. Okay. The confession then becomes a ticket to salvation and puts the priest in charge of the reconciliation between human and God and then will go back to the Old Testament. The, the, the priesthood of men was eliminated in the New Testament with the uh, pro, the introduction of the Lord Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. And Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, uh, eliminates the priesthood. I mean, proclaims the total elimination of the priesthood of, uh, of men. And if there is no priest, then it should not be a confession. When you arrive... Uh, in chapter 8 of Hebrews, chapter 7 really about six times eliminates the priesthood of men. It's unbelievable. If you read it, and I never read it when I was starting to be a priest. And I had spoken to priests who never read it. I spoke to one, and when he read the book of Hebrews, he left the priesthood. Because he knew that he could not be another. Anyone else who would like to be the one who forgives sins and saves people, that person is, an, is, is, a, is uh, taking the place of the Lord Jesus. So when you were studying to be a Catholic priest, yes. you were taught that your priesthood was on the same level as the priesthood of Christ? Yes, actually, we are... We are the representatives of Christ. The Pope is the vicar of Christ, as well as the Holy Father. It's the worst flag blasphemy that you can hear to take not only the place of... There is only one Holy Father. You see that in the news. Holy, the Holy Father, the Holy Father, the Holy Father. This is when God is taking the plane and visiting Cuba. You know, the Holy Father visited Cuba and that changed the entire thing. The Holy, and then, to call the Holy Father infallible. Imagine something like that. There is only one infallible, God. And then to call the Holy Father the biker of Christ, in the place of Christ. And then... All the traditions, the, the, that authority is transferred to the bishops, and that authority is transferred to the, to the, to the priest. And that priest has that authority. But look, uh, when uh, who, uh, the writer of Hebrews, you know, I remember someone who said, I, we don't know uh, who wrote Hebrews, but when we get to heaven, we'll shake the hands of Paul and say, you did a good job. <laughs> okay. Did you hear that before? Okay. <laughs> now, that's interesting when you arrive in chapter 8 of Hebrews. Now, you know, after he speaks so much from chapter 4 to 7, a lot of theology about priesthood, when he arrives in chapter 8, says, what is the point, Paul? What are you talking about? You know, you have met, met people who talk and talk and talk like me, and then you say, what's the point, Noe? Here it is. Now, what is the point? 8, 1. Now, Hebrews 8, now, 1. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. 
we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on heaven, and so on. And then in verse uh, in verse 5, it says, The old priests serve as a copy and shadow of heavenly things. But now it's changed, verse 6, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent um, than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better. Now, uh, verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, the priesthood of the Old Testament, there would have been no occasion to, to look for the second. Uh, and um, in verse uh, 13, in speaking of a new covenant, a new priesthood of Jesus, he makes the first, first what? The first priesthood, what? Obsolete. obsolete. So you don't need it anymore. Because there's no power. Obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. I said that he's talking to the Hebrews, say, no more priesthood. And what if... We don't have all the time in the world, but I would love to spend at least 30 lessons on this. You know, where the priesthood of the Roman Catholicism is very much, very similar to the priesthood of the Old Testament. The same incense, the same robes, the same waters, the same, and the forgiveness of sin uh, through confession. That is, in contrast with the confession, the, uh, the, the confession for the forgiveness of sin, we confess our sins to the only priest, which is the Lord Jesus, and confess to God through the Lord Jesus. This is what happens when someone comes to Christ is because the Father resurrects the person that is dead in trespasses and sins. And the moment the person resurrects again to a life, is born again, that person, the first thing that he, that person sees is his horrible life. He sees his sin. Otherwise, if we don't see our sin, we don't need Jesus. For what? You see your sin, and you see the tremendous hell that was there, and you came up, and then you immediately run to Jesus. The first thing that, you, that we do is, God, please forgive me. How could it be that you pass all my sin to the Lord Jesus, and I am forgiven? That's the moment you are forgiven. And when we present the gospel, we are acting with the, pre the royal priesthood of the believers, providing forgiveness of sin by God through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus, when the person becomes a Christian. And no one becomes a Christian is when God makes that person a Christian by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we have to measure every word because... But is that clear? The difference is you are forgiven. And then when we sin, we immediately are moved not by the desire to go to a man or to a priest or to call the person for your accountability. No, you immediately feel the power of the Holy Spirit in your heart that will move you to repentance and you say, my Lord, my God, please forgive me. I don't want to do this again. Period. And you are forgiven. That's a, demo a clear demonstration that you are a child of God. And many of us 
have had those experiences, say, why did I do that? I am a child of God. What's the matter with me? Um, one sin that we commit often is against the Tenth Commandment. Any desire to be like, or somebody's doing better than we do, <laughs> you know, or desire to have more than or more than we have, is, is a tendency to do that. And when we catch ourselves, and, and it has been very nice for Mimi and I, when we talk, you know, when we began to say, oh, we should have done this, and that is it. And then she says, no, eh, ten, ten. <laughs> But I do the same thing to her. <laughs> yeah. But again, let me tell you something that is horrible, and I'm sure that many Roman Catholics identify themselves with this. On Saturday is the confession day. I don't know if you knew that. Every Saturday, the doors open in the afternoon and in the evening for the Roman Catholics to go to confession and just say that you have the lines there is when the priest usually is available to receive confession and faithful Roman Catholics will go to confession because they don't dare to take communion if you don't physically go in front of the, of, of the priest for your confession on Saturday you you get the confession and you guard yourself so much not to sin so on Sunday you can take communion you take communion on Sunday and say oh I was able to take communion because I was forgiven and then on Monday if you sin you are already condemned so it is okay to continue to sin because Saturday is coming down the road so on Saturday, you go to confession. On Sunday, you, you have communion. And on Monday, you start again. And you take the trash out every Saturday. The, let me see if you understand this point. If you sin, you are already condemned. So what difference? It, nothing will stop you from sinning more. You see what I mean? You are already in mortal sin. If you will die, some people like me when I was a Roman Catholic I will go crazy looking for a priest to confess on Tuesday and then on Thursday I realized that I have sinned again so I will go back and look for I could not wait until Saturday because I knew that if I die I will be in mortal sin and I will be going to hell he did the same thing wow but it's amazing that that is is living in fear and depending upon a human being. So you understand the difference. Now, people say, ah, oh, you uh, Protestants, you confess to God so you have the freedom to sin any time because all you have to say is, I'm sorry, God. No, 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 no. We, have the, we don't have the freedom to sin. But when we sin, we have an act of contrition that doesn't come from us, comes from the Holy Spirit within us, you know, and not an act of attrition when I just confess my sin to get my ticket to heaven. We re Am I saying something that yeah, I hope you understand? Because yeah, I'm in my mind I'm translating from Spanish to English, <laughs> but but it makes sense. Okay, uh, so. That's the danger of this, of, of, uh, 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 this confession uh, of sin by the priest. Uh, now, interesting enough, uh, that was formally instituted in 1215. Before that, the church, I, I, I had to do much more investigation as to what did they do before. But... Um, we already dealt with 29 that in, in the year 1220 the transubstantiated wafer was or the host that they come call 
uh, was put up there for adoration. I remember in the seminary and as a Roman Catholic spending 40 days of adoration on our knees for, um, not 40 days, 40 hours. 40 hours and uh, uh, worshiping the host. And they have, and any time we will leave, somebody will kneel next, next to us. We spend a little bit of time together, then one leave. But for 40 hours, a group of people always will worship that host. And God said to us, you should worship me in spirit and in truth. John 4.24. We learned that last time. Okay. In 1229, the Bible was forbidden to laymen to read. It was placed on the index book as if as today you will put a pornographic book you know that is not to read uh, the Lefeniman of men of the many many men the human phenomena of Taylor de Chardin was put as, as the prohibit books he was the first one who tried to do uh, and the human phenomena is the name of the book. Taylor de Chardin is probably one of the most celebrated philosophers of the 20th century. He died in the 20th century. And he was the one who claimed the vital principle as if God created life on one cell one living cell and came to the conclusion that even with the labs that we have today men had been able to transform life from one uh, in different space or making uh, life a little better or whatever but up to this moment no one has a, has been able to create life so he came with the idea the 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 omega point where God has to create life. And in order not to contradict Darwin, he said, and God allowed one cell to evolve in such a way that now we are where we are, but God didn't have to bother creating us because all he had to do was to create the vital principle, which was one living cell, and allowed that cell to evolve. Because of that, that book was put in the index book. The, you know, later on, when he became so famous, then he was taken out in the church, in the Roman Church. Uh, and the uh, Roman Catholicism actually welcomed his theories because he was able to make a marriage between God and evolution, without uh, keeping God in evolution as a great favor to God. Did you hear that? You know, so so Darwin will not have to, to put, why am I saying this? All I have to say is that the Bible was put in the in the book in the prohibited books. You want to know why? The big discussion, even this is moving towards reformation. The big discussion why is because if lay men or women for that matter read the Bible they were going to discover that the Bible did not agree with the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church and anyone who reads the Bible carefully and discovers that the Bible and the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church do not agree they will have to make a decision who to obey, God or men. And because in this time the Bible began to be translated, began to be, so people began to read the Bible, 
and discovered that um, there were conflicts, so in order not to lose people, the best thing to prevent them from leaving the Roman Catholic traditions was to stop them from reading the Bible. Now, what is the excuse? The excuse sounds very good, and by the way, the reformers agree with it. The excuse is that, agree with it up to a certain point. The excuse is that, is that if you are not trained to read the Bible, if you don't know hermeneutics, and you begin to create doctrine and teach those doctrines, chances are that you have taken those doctrines out of context. And then you can be wrong. Therefore, don't you touch the Bible. Let us read the Bible and we interpret it for you. Because we know better. So, up to, this, to that point, until Vatican II, imagine that. The church did not allow people to read the Bible because they knew that they were going to make mistakes and they were going to live because they would have a wrong interpretation. Well, the reformers agree with the Roman Catholic. says, you can read the Bible and the Holy Spirit is going to interpret the Bible for you. But you cannot read the Bible and teach doctrines if you have not done hermeneutics hermeneutics on that Bible and do the right interpretation. So, to a point, even the, the biblical scholars, we, we do read the Bible and the Holy Spirit will interpret the Bible for us as we read, uh, but if we are going to teach we better or preach, we better check with what you know, the people who have given their entire life to, to study the Bible properly with uh, the right hermeneutics will be able to understand. So when did they take off the forbidden list? And after the Vatican II, I think it was, uh, oh boy, I will, we will get there, I cannot remember exactly, because I don't know if the First Vatican Council had something to do with that, but definitely the Second Vatican Council uh, um, took it out and, al and allowed the people to read the Bible. You know, that, that is a mystery to me, because that is going to happen. Anyway, what they do is they will advise the Roman Catholics to make sure that on the first page of the Bible there is something called imprimatur, with a little cross and the signature of a bishop who has given permission to publish that particular Bible. And those particular Bibles will take exception to certain things, and they have <coughs> explanations underneath to let, help them to understand the Bible. For instance, when the Bible talks about the brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus. See? They say no. Mary did not have any more children because we have the dogma of the perpetual virginity of Mary. She didn't lose her virginity with the birth of the Lord Jesus. And since then she didn't have any more children. So the, up to today is called the Virgin Mary. I kind of hesitate when I say, we don't say the Virgin Mary, we say Mary. But she was virgin before the birth of the Lord Jesus. So, 
it is kind of complicated, but when you say Virgin Mary, some of the Protestants don't say Virgin Mary because they do not agree with the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church that she was virgin forever because the Bible says that she had other children. When they want to explain that to somebody, they say, what happens is that in that culture, in that time, cousins and friends and people of the same neighborhood were, are called brothers and sisters. So, is, is, is an explanation. Uh, the other thing is, when you talk about the Immaculate Conception, um, in, the, in the Bible, they, uh, they go through extremes of, of, of even changing the Bible. Isn't it amazing? I opened it and I found it. It says this. Um, it says, the, the Father... This is nu number 491 in, in, in verse, verse 491. This book has actually no numerals, but whatever you want to find is there. I'm going to read it. Immaculate Conception, Con uh, Conception confesses as po Pope Pius IX proclaimed in 1854. The most blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of the Almighty God and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. She was born without original sin. She was the only one who was born Christian. No sin. The splendor of the entirely unique holiness by which Mary is enriched from the first instant of her conception comes wholly from Christ. She is redeemed in more exalted fashion by reason of the merits of her son. You know, before her son, she still gave, the father blessed Mary more than any other created person. In Christ, this is quote, okay, quote from the Bible. In Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and chose her in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. So this proves from the Bible and the quotation, do you want to hear the quotation? Is Ephesians 1, 3, 4. And I would like you to compare that. Ephesians, so you, are, you, you know that I'm telling the truth. Ephesians 1, 3, 1. And it says here, chose her before the foundation of the world. Now, if you read your Bible, I'm going to read it again. And you see if there is any addition or subtraction in this quote. Let me read it again. I'm going to read the way it is there. The Father. This is Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 4. Quote, The Father blessed Mary more than any other created person. That's the, that's the introduction now. Quotation. In Christ, with every spiritual blessing. Is it there? Yes. In the heavenly places. And chose her in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. Is that what it says there? What does it say? Us. Us. They change one pronoun. You know, and I want somebody to see that I am not reading something that is not true. You will, yeah. will be my witness? Okay. Okay. Now, when you read this book that they quote the Bible, and that quotation is altered in the, 
in this book, you are playing with Revelation 18, where it says what? You do not add or subtract anything from the Bible. This is, don't you feel like shaking? I say, how can it be done? No, if you, uh, if you open a Roman Catholic Bible to the Ephesians 1, 3, it's going to, no. going to say us. It's going to say us. But when you read this, and it's presented by the priest, and the people do not have the Bible, and do not read the Bible, they don't have any idea. Do you know what Roman Catholics admired much? of us that we are able to quote the Bible that we, are able, we know what it is they say how did you do that they, all the time they say you must how, how you know and I said I have children in the church I was in a church in Pennsylvania where there were children seven years old who already had read the entire Bible I, I was taken by that seven years old you know there was one who was nine years old and he was so um, he, he read the Bible and was so serious about about the commandments that they invited us for lunch and a person who visited the church for the first time was invited to lunch and when they walk into the house it was a magnificent house you know they open the house and he says oh my god and the kids fell on the floor on the knees I said what happened he said you just mentioned the name of the Lord in vain when you mentioned the name of the Lord they fell on the floor to worship him <laughs> imagine that he said what is that Exodus 20. It's beautiful. The, the, the richness that we have here without adding and subtracting. I, I always get out of the theme, but I think this will help you to remember. Okay. That's an excuse for me to go in the rabbit trail. Okay. Uh, the, if you forbid to read the Bible, now the question is, why do they allow thou to read the Bible? Because they realize that that accusation is true. So they say, okay, we change that. So you can continue to read the Bible. But the truth of the matter, and I, I want to challenge anybody, that over a, a, a great percentage, almost 100%, maybe 80, maybe 70, but a great percentage of Roman Catholics never read the entire Bible. They never have read it. Ask, ask anyone and see. Because it is, you, ha you have sufficient salvation on the priest. And why to complicate matters when the, when the priest presents an easy plan of salvation? What is the blessed plan of salvation? You are born, you become a Christian by a priest when you are infused with the baptism. Now you are a Christian. And then if you sin, no problem, come, the priest will give you absolution and you are a Christian again. You are safe again. And if you are going to die, all you have to do is call the priest and, you, and, and some holy water and you are again ready to go. It's an easy. Why, why to complicate your life? The last rites is when you are about to die and you did not have the chance to confess or you are, you are, you are in unconscious. Then they put oil in your forehead and your hands and in your heart and your feet that and that will forgive your sins. If you, you can die at peace. People say, uh, is, uh, did somebody die? And the first question to ask, did he get the last rites? No. Oh, I'm sorry. You see, 
uh, and if they got the last rights, you're okay. So it's, 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 however, however, in their doctrine says that the person should have had an act of contrition before he got the last rites. And it, it is more complicated than the Bible. But the truth of the matter is that Roman Catholics, and I'm saying this to everyone who sees the, these videos, the Roman Catholics, the majority of them do not read the Bible and have never, ever read this book, The Doctrines of the Roman Catholic. I am almost convinced that if a Roman Catholic reads this catechism that was signed by John Paul II uh, and is a universal, um, a, a, there is the signature of the Pope. It's a, it's a universal it's catechism it's for all the countries, all the ages, everything. It's, it's a compendium. They have not read it. And if they read it, this book will run them, will, will make them run to the Bible and to Christ. Interesting enough, this catechism was the last straw to send me directly to the Bible. Because I was horrified when this catechism has in the chapter who is a Catholic denies Christ. Now I think I have to go there, right? Aha. Uh -huh. I will be jumping. But that's okay. Um, there is, there is, oh, by the way, before, since this opened in this page, these are the Ten Commandments. Here is in the book. I didn't make this up. Here are the Ten Commandments. These are the Ten Commandments according to Exodus in the Bible. It says, Exodus. Ten Commandments according to Exodus. Here are the Ten Commandments according to Deuteronomy. So they know the Bible. They abandon that. And here are the Ten Commandments according to the Roman, Roman Catholicism. Here they see the Second Commandment. Here you don't see it. Is blank. I thought they combined the first two and then separated them. And the last the two and the ten, they divided into two. To not covet your, the wife of your neighbor and to not covet the goods. But the commandment says do not covet. See? Anything. But that is playing with the Bible. I mean, I'm I think this speaks by itself. Now, who is a Roman Catholic? Or who belongs to the Catholic Church? They mean by that, who belongs to the Roman Catholic Church? Okay? This, the title of this book is incorrect. Do you agree with me or not? Because we are Catholics. Anyone who trusts in Christ alone for your salvation in the entire world are the universal, is the, um, the people are the universal church of Christ. And universal is Catholic. Catholic and universal is the same word. See? So all the Christians in the world See, our, our is the church of, of the Lord Jesus. The, that's why the church is a universal church. In other words, it's a Catholic church. But we are not, is Roman Catholics. Because you could not be 
Roman, you, you cannot be uh, um, the Orlando Church being different than the Universal Church and call it the Orlando Church Universal. You see the... Maybe I didn't get it. it yeah, it's, it's one or the other. It cannot be both the same thing. You cannot be Roman and Catholic. Either you are Roman or you are Catholic, but you cannot be Roman Catholic. I mean, it, it's a contradiction. It's a, it's a contradiction. But this man, Roman Catholic, I said, who belongs to this church? You ready for this? This, any Roman Catholic that will read this will run away from Catholicism and will run to the Bible, will run to Jesus. Let's begin with the fact that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but by me. Is exclusive. No, there is no salvation in anyone else. See, uh, Acts 4:12. There is no salvation only in Jesus. Now, who belongs to the God? fully incorporated in the society of the church are those who possessing the spirit of Christ accept all the means of salvation given to the church. What's wrong with that picture? How many means of salvation are there? You know, you cannot accept all the means. Just by saying that, you are already in shaky land. Given to the church together with her entire organization and who by the bonds constituted by the profession of faith you have to profess faith as part of your salvation the sacraments is another means of salvation ecclesiast ecclesiast ecclesiastical government you have to believe in all the dogmas of the government of the church in communion are joined in the visible structure of the Church of Christ who rules her through the supreme pontiff, pontiff and the bishops. Even though in the Church, one who does not, however, perseveres in charity. Uh, do you know what that means? What does it mean? Who does works. <laughs> Persevere in doing works. Listen to that. Even though incorporated into the church, because you believe in the Pope, and you believe in this, and the sacraments, and you believe in Christ, and you have faith. One who does not, however, persevere in charity is not safe. You can believe in Christ, but if you don't persevere in good works, you are not safe. Now, the Bible says, you trust in Christ and you are safe. You don't. Yeah, it says in John 3, uh, 18. What does it say? If you believe, you are what? Safe. If you do not believe, you are already condemned. Why? Because you don't persevere in charity? No, because you did not believe in the only Son of, the, of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. It's not safe. He remains indeed in the bosom of the church, but in body, not in heart. What do you think about that contradiction? Either you are in or you are not. You cannot be in the church in body, because if you don't believe, you are not part of the church. Does it make sense? Just that will 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 move you when you compare this with with what the bible says 
it will move you to run to, for safety. Now, this is only, this is not the worst part, even though it's really bad. Who, the church, that she is joined in many ways to the baptized who are honored by the name of Christians, but do not pros profess the Catholic faith in its entirety, or have not preserved unity or communion under the su successor of Peter. In other words, at this moment, by decree of this book, you are Roman Catholics. Because now we have union with those who don't, this is the new before, in the, in the uh, Council of Trent, anyone who was a Christian, they, they put about 100 condemnations. They were not brothers. Now, uh, uh, in 1994, when this book was written, now we are brothers. Now you are accepted. Now you can be, you, can, you don't have to be Catholic in order to go to heaven. That's what they are saying. Uh, also, <laughs> also all, uh, they said the other people who are Catholics are now the Orthodox Catholic Church. And they say, this communion is so profound that it lacks little to attain the fullness that would permit a common celebration of the Lord's Eucharist between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. And guess what? Now it's happening. They are doing it and it's okay for them. But here is something that I like, I like you to read very loud. The Church and the non- Christians. Now, listen to that word, non-Christians. It, it indicates in this book that the non-Christians are also Roman Catholics. What are, what are we saying here? If you are non-Christian and you are Catholic and you are united to the Roman Catholic Church, then Christ disappears. Did you? If a non-Christian belong to the Roman Catholic Church, can a non-Christian belong to this church? No. Because that person says, I don't need Christ, but I want to be in the church. L let me read it. Those who have not yet received the gospel are related to the people of God in various ways. They are using a lot of ambiguity. You know, are related means you are part of us. Number one, the Jewish people. When she, that means the church, delves into her own mystery, the church, the people of God in the new covenant discovers her link to the Jewish people. So the Jewish people are part now of the Roman Catholic Church. The first to hear the word of God, they were the Jewish people. The Jewish faith, unlike other non-Christian religions, is already a response to God's revelation in the Old Covenant. And let me quote it. He says, To the Jews belong the sonship, that quote chapter 9 of Romans. The glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises to them belong the patriarchs, and in their race according to the flesh, and from their race according to the flesh is Christ. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. The sovereignty of God brings the Jewish people into the Roman Catholic. But what is the problem with the Jewish people? 
They don't believe in Christ. Jesus is not divine to them. They believe in the historical Jesus, but they do not believe in Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah, which is what gives us salvation. I don't know if you're feeling the, the, the weight of this. Do you want, you want another step into, the, into this sand? Here goes the next one. The next people... Uh, and when one considers the future, God's people of the Old Test Covenant and the new people tend towards similar goals, expectations of the coming Messiah. We, we, we accept them because they are expecting the Messiah someday. But that's not what the Bible says. Now, the next people, 841, who are related within the bosom of the Roman Catholic Church. You want to hear who? Take a guess. Yes. Yes. You have to come here. I hate to bring you here because you are so tall. I'm so tiny. <laughs> but the church relationship with the Muslims, the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator. Jesus disappeared, God disappeared, the Creator. You want to cry? Go ahead. Yeah. In the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham. Forget Jesus, forget God. It's Abraham in the picture. And together with us, they adore the one merciful God. Mankind's judge on the last day. And the quotation for this is from the saints and people from the past. This alone will send you running. Now what is the, what is the wrong with this picture again? It is not the same God of the Bible. Allah is not the son of the Bible. I, I remember Ruth getting upset to me when I say there is no God, right? Unless it is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Otherwise, there is no God. It has to be Allah is not God because it's not the biblical God, the Trinity. But these people say they and us adore the same God. With us they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge of the last day. This is enough to deny Jesus. You don't need Jesus anymore. He disappears, he comes the Creator. 8.42 The church, now comes another group. You ready for this? This is a group that embraces all oriental religions. Everyone, Buddhist, whatever you want to know. And that is a number, numeral 842. Anyone can check that out. I'm not making this up. This particular chapter sent me out of the Roman Catholic Church. That, that was the last... Yeah, because I said, I cannot be in a, a church that is not Christian. Christ here disappeared. It doesn't mean that there are no Roman Catholics who are Christians. But the institution with this doctrine cannot qualify as a Christian church. Now, you want to be horrified? There are two more big ones. Look at this. The church bond union with non-Christian religions. Just by saying that, you don't want to have any union with non-Christians if you are a Christian. Do, do I sound like a lawyer almost? 
the church bond with non-Christian religion is in the first place the common origin and end of the human race. That's common to us. The fact that there is their union is universal. All nations form but one community. This is so because all stem from the one stock with God, which God created to people the, to people the entire earth, and also because all share a common destiny. Dear ones, not all of us share the common destiny. I mean, <laughs> destiny. Namely, God. Yes, all will go to God. But not for salvation. Some arrive and will go to hell. And some arrive and will go. It's not the same destiny. His providence, evident goodness, and saved design extend to all against the day when the elect are gathered together in the holy city. And do you hear the contradiction again? All will be safe but also but only the elect. So what do we do? The elect is not all. But at the end of the day the elect are all. Yeah, but logically not, you know, but for them, that's the way. So, what do we follow? The Bible or the tenets of any other religion? Do you want to hear how do they compromise the Bible? Ready? I'm just reading. The Catholic Church recognizes in other religions that search among shadows and images for the God who is unknown yet near, since he gives life and breath and all things and wants all men to be safe. If God wants that, that's what God, get. God gets. Thus, the church considers all goodness and truth found in these religions. And here it becomes hairy because the truth here becomes relative. It's not absolute truth anymore. What is truth to you, even though it's contrary to what is truth to me, both are truth, even though they are opposite. I mean, we should not even, I mean, I, 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 when I read something like that, I throw all these things away, that book, all the books, all the truth, and go and have myself a nice cup of Colombian coffee. <laughs> no? Look at this. Does the church consider all goodness and truth found in this as a preparation for the gospel and given by him who enlighten all men that they may that they may at length have life. In other words, if you are a Buddhist, continue to be Buddhist because eventually that Buddhism is going to take you to Jesus. To the truth. If you are a Muslim, go ahead, but be a good Muslim. If you are in number 844, in their religious behavior, however, men also display the limits and errors that disfigure the image of God in them. Very often, deceived by the evil one, men is the evil's fault. It's, the devil made me do it. Here it goes. Very often, the civil by the evil one, men had become vain in their reasoning and have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and served the creature 
rather than the Creator. That sounds like Romans 1. Or else, living and dying in this world without God, they are exposed to ultimate despair. Ultimate despair. And then, they say something interesting. Out, well, I'm going to read 847 before I read 846. 847. This is, this is really, at this point, when you read 847, then definitely the father made a mistake killing his son. What for? If there was any, when the Lord Jesus was in Gethsemane, crying out, Daddy, 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 pass this cup away from me. How many times? Three times. And was the cosmic silence of Gethsemane. Because God did not answer. Why God did not answer? Because there is no other way. But Jesus was saying, if there is any other way to save the elect, don't send me to the cross. Don't let me drink that poison of their sin. And God says, there is no other way. And he went to the cross, and at the cross he says, my God, my God, why? Why didn't he say, Daddy? He was in front of a judge for us was in front of God. And when God discharged all the wrath that was coming upon us, upon Jesus, then he says, all has been completed and returned the friendship to Daddy and says, Daddy, into your hands I commit my spirit. You see, the, all of that is of nonsense if anyone can be saved without Christ. Correct? Now let me read it. 847. The fact that some people are not safe, there are people who, who are not safe outside of the... Well, let me begin with 846 so it will make sense. <laughs> the title is Outside of the church there is no salvation. What do you think about that? We cannot say yes and we cannot say no. Because the moment you are safe, what happens to you? You belong to the church. So naturally, if you are safe, you are in the church. So there is no salvation outside of this church because in order to be church, you have to be safe. Does it make sense? Okay. So if we sin, then we're outside of the church. Obviously. And we're no longer Roman Catholics because we're outside of the church. But that's what they meant. Outside of the Roman Catholic Church, there is no salvation. But... If they say outside of the church there is salvation, they are saying something true. Because in order to be safe, you have to be in the church. Right? Because you become... To be invisible church, not necessarily visible church. Yeah, but, but, but the moment you believe, you are in the church. Anyone who does not believe, they might be here, but they are not in the church. But you can still lose your salvation and be in the church because you sin. Oh, yeah. And that's part of the premises. Now, listen to this. I better read it. How are we to understand this affirmation often repeated by the church fathers? Reformulated positively, it means that all salvation comes from Christ, the head through the church, which is the body. Basing itself on scriptures and tradition and counsel teachers. Did you hear that? Basing this doctrine in what? And three authorities. In scripture, tradition, 
the council teaches that the church, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. What they are saying is, the institution is necessary for you to be safe. And what we are saying is that Christ is necessary for us to salvation, and when we come to Christ, we go to the church. It's a little bit more complicated than I thought. The one Christ is the mediator and the way of salvation. He is present to us in his body, which is the church. He himself explicitly asserted the necessity of faith and baptism. Baptism for them means the water, the necessity. And thereby affirmed at the same time the necessity of the church, which men enter through baptism. How do you enter the church? Through baptism? No. Not through baptism of water. You enter the church through faith in Christ alone. And for the Presbyterian child who is baptized, that child is not baptized to make him a Christian. He's baptized to, with the expectation that eventually through faith that child becomes a Christian. In other, in the Reformed Baptists or the Baptists, they uh, wait until somebody professes to be a Christian and then they baptize, but the baptism is not to make him a Christian. In the Roman Church, you become a Christian by the baptism of the water. That's why he says, church which men enter through baptism, as through a door. It's not by faith that you become a member of the church. It's by baptism. Hence, they could not be saved who knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ will refuse either to enter it or to remain in it. So if you are not in the Roman Catholic Church, you are not safe. But in order to make you safe, we'll make you a member of the Roman Catholic Church by saying, you see what I mean? Stop playing games with the souls of men. Now, You know when you, they send you a contract and everything that is explicit is there and when something is hidden away, they put the little, the little letters, the little, small, fine print. Here is the fine print. This affirmation, <laughs> that's the, is not aimed to those who, through no fault of their own, do not know Christ and his church. If it's not your fault that you don't know Christ. It's not your fault, so you can't be safe without Christ. Now the question is, how can you be safe? You want to hear the answer? Here it is. <laughs> Those who... Have it's good that I don't give the answer. They give the answer. Those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and moved by grace try in their actions to do his will as they know, as, as they know it, through the dictates of their conscience. You are saved by your conscience. Those two may achieve eternal salvation. Here you dismiss Christ. Here you dismiss Christ. Although, oh, 848, although in ways known to himself, to himself. God can lead those who, through no fault of their own, it's not our fault. I see, but it's not my fault. Are ignorant of the gospel to that faith without which it's impossible to please him. It is impossible to please him without the gospel. But he says, but those who don't know the gospel, the church still has the obligation 
and also the sacred right to evangelize all men. And I wrote in my, in my dissertation, why? Why are you going to bring condemnation with the gospel when they were going to be safe just following their own conscience? Uh, okay. This, is, this was heavy duty. And uh, now, this is more difficult than the Bible. How can you reconcile those two? And how do you dare change scriptures to convince people of things? If I do not read the Bible and they tell me this, and sounds so pretty, doesn't sound good? For anyone who, does, who doesn't know the Bible, any one of you who have read the Bible, you present this, and immediately you begin to reject. Why? Because you are very familiar with the good money. When they present false bills, you immediately compare with the, with the real, and, and you understand. Uh, the time is gone. <laughs> any questions here? Years? No. This catechism was written by was it was signed by by John Paul II. Was signed by John Paul II, but was written really by the Office of the Proclamation, Propagation of the Faith, who, the person who heads that office is considered to be more powerful than the Pope. Okay? And guess who wrote this when John Paul II was Pope? The next Pope. What was his name? He is still alive. Benedict. Benedict. The Ratzinger. This was written by Ratzinger. But it was signed by John Paul II. And he says, the catechism of the Catholic Church, which I approved June 25th, last, which is in 1992, actually, 93, it was published in English in 1994. Or the other way around. I, but it was uh, not until 1994. Before this, there were a number of little catechisms in all parts of the world. And the, some of them contradict each other and things like that. So he decided to unite all of them into one. Last, and the publication, publication of which I today order by virtue of my apostolic authority is a statement of the church faith and of Catholic doctrine, attested to or illuminated by, ready for this? Three authorities. By sacred scripture, the apostolic tradition, and the church magisterium. I declare it to be a sure norm for teaching the faith and thus a valid and legit, legitimate instrument for ecclesiastical communion, ecclesial communion, may serve to renewal to which the Holy Spirit ceaselessly calls the Church of God, the body of Christ, on her pilgrimage. And then um, I found here uh, in number 82, I'm going to read what it says here. As a result, the church to whom the transmission and interpretation of revelation is entrusted, the church is responsible to interpret it. Revelation is does not derive her certainty of all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Does not. 
trust the scriptures alone. Put your glasses on. <laughs> but that's what it says, right? Does not entrust the scriptures alone. Does it sound like a contradiction to our doctrine? Scriptures alone. Sola Scriptura. Now, so to whom he entrusts, to whom he entrusts the truth, the task of giving authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether in his written form or in form of tradition, the Word of God is not the Word, is not, has, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church, church alone. alone. So you don't trust the scriptures alone, but you trust the church alone. Now you understand my little game of the three authorities. And the time is gone. But yes, you have one minute, two minutes. Uh, so if you have a uh, Roman Catholic who rejects some of the catechism, what is their status in the Roman Church? I am glad you asked this question, this very important question. The majority, uh, many, not majority, but many of the Roman Catholics who question, who asked me to show them in the catechism what I am saying, have come out of the Roman Catholic Church. Have come out of the Roman Catholic Church. But what, what's their standing if they were doing it? Oh, I don't believe that Muslims can go to heaven. I don't believe, you know, section 841. I reject that. Okay. Uh, first of all, I don't, if they do, yeah. they will continue to read and they question many more things in there. And at that time, if it's truly the work of the Holy Spirit. If they come there, I did that, and I questioned this, and the priest said to me this, the bishop, or the monsignor, he said, I don't think you can be a Roman Catholic any longer because God has spoken to you in a very special way. And he hugged me. You know, so they fully realized that in conscience I cannot follow this. But the interesting thing is that the majority of the people read this but not the Bible. So they follow, they continue to follow these doctrines. And if they read the Bible, they probably, um, they probably read just whatever they are able to open. And that's it. But um, I believe uh, uh, my message to the Roman Catholics is to begin to read the Bible. And if they have never read the Bible, it's the most important book in the entire universe. It's the, it's the book that has driven culture, art, mm, literature, uh, uh, even science. You know, there is no any author that that, that is called famous, that somehow, somewhere have not mentioned the Bible. It's the book written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is written by God. Therefore, if you read, if you never read the Bible, my advice is to begin with the Gospel of John. I don't know why I say that, I don't have any reason for, but that's the way I began. The Gospel of John, and then whatever you do not understand, don't worry. Mark it, and the next day with a good cup of Colombian coffee, read from there. Uh, um, and then the following day, the same way, the following day, the same day, and eventually within six or, or a month or a year, you have arrived at Revelation, at, at Apocalypse. Now, the interesting thing that happened to many, including me, is that what I did not understand, I did not stop to try to investigate. I continued to read, and eventually, 
the next part explained to me the first part. Now, this is not an, ex an, a, an extraordinary revelation. Why? That's the way you read any book. <laughs> you begin to read and you do not understand what is going on until you finish. And sometimes, even until the last chapter, you say, wow. Then when you finish, you go back to Genesis and begin to read the entire Bible. And it's one of the most exciting books in the entire world. It's, it's, it is excited. And for us to present the Bible, we need to have a knowledge of the Bible. We just cannot go to the Roman Catholic or to anybody and say, read the Bible, and if we have not read it. That is probably, um, probably uh, what do you call when doctors do malpractice. <laughs> it's, it's Christian malpractice. How, how in the world anybody will say trust in Christ when you don't? How in the world do you say read the Bible when you have not read it? When you are not able to connect the Bible. We have a Bible study. No, no, some of you are. We are almost six years, six years into the Bible. We went from Genesis and uh, last week we'll finish Joel. But these men who are in this Bible study, they are able to pick up a book and connect to all the New Testament. And they are able to clearly say, for instance, the last time we, we, we took Joel. You know, Joel, insignificant prophet, he wrote a sermon that was used about 900 years after, maybe 700, 800 to 900, we don't know yet, was used, and with that sermon, 5,000 people got converted into the church, into a Christian church. Isn't that amazing? Peter used that sermon in chapter 2 of the Acts of the Apostles. He didn't change anything, word by word, exactly. And then say, all who believe in the Lord shall be saved. That is written in the Old Testament. And then Peter takes that and says, let me tell you who is the Lord. And presents the Lord Jesus so clearly. That Jesus that you kill, but was predestined to do so by the Father himself. And whoever believes in it shall be saved. And what happened? With that sermon written all that time before, they were cut to the heart. No one says, repeat this little sentence. And, and you shall be saved. No, they were cut to the heart and said, what shall we do? And she says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Would you close us in prayer?